Recording is on. All right. Well, everybody, it is February the 9th, 2021, and it's 5.04, and it's 5.04 for me. Um, today, we have a very interesting guest. Indeed, we have the honor of having uh, Stephen from The Farm Podcast. And I think this is going to be really a very interesting uh, discussion. So, uh, Stephen... May I call you Stephen Snyder? Is that right? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Okay, well, can I call you Stephen? Yes, Stephen is fine too. Just like I said, don't call me Steve, please. <laughs> no, no, we definitely won't call you Steve. Okay, Stephen. Um, yeah, we, we're going to keep it all light and informal. Um, and so uh, I'm here in, in Greece. Sophie's in Ireland. Uh, Gary's in Australia. Um, I think uh, we've got Going South on. And little Englander. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we've got a few people around the world, and then we'll record this, and it'll go out uh, to our modest our modest viewing audience. So, uh, so, so welcome, Stephen. Oh, thank you very much for having me on, sir. Well, uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, the very first question I've got is about uh, somebody called Jeff Hull. Uh, Jeff Hull uh, really is a really fascinating character for me uh, because he started out uh, doing an ARG, an ARG, and it's a, quite of a revolutionary one, I think, after Ong's Hat, which I think a lot of people credit as being the first one. Then uh, I think that Jeff Hull did the, um, uh, what was it called again? The, the Jejun Institute, I believe. Mm, right. here. And then it, it spun off um, into uh, In Dark Axiom, uh, which with Spencer McCall. And uh, we, we interviewed them a bit. And they weren't, they weren't very keen uh, after a while because they thought we had a kind of anti-vax stance, where I don't think we really have an anti-vax stance. I think we have a more you know anti-mandate stance than anti-vax. I mean, I don't mind vaxxers and stuff I, all my kids are vaccinated so and so am i so so anyway um okay so Stephen, uh, do you know about jeff hull and the whole project and what it was about um because uh i i've uh, i've done a bit of uh, well i did quite a bit of research because i was embarking on an arg myself but um do you know anything about in bright axiom uh spencer uh, mccall and Jeff Hull and that group and, and what they up to uh, in San Francisco? Well, I have, you know, wondered about it. I don't, I, I've been trying for a while actually myself to find a little bit more information on Jeff Hull personally. Um, you know, I mean, it did seem like there was a decent amount of, I mean, I know they tried to kind of downplay it. I think it was like, what did he say? Like $3 million over three years. Um, running the Jejun Institute ARG, I believe, which, you know, I mean, in the 21st century, that's not a lot of money, but I mean, certainly most people in the world couldn't afford to put aside a million dollars a year to run an ARG either. So um, I have kind of wondered, you know, specifically where exactly some of the money was coming from for some of this stuff. And then also, you know, the area you're kind of doing it out of in San Francisco. I mean, obviously real estate there isn't cheap. Um, the other thing that was, you know, that kind of stood out to me was the, oh, I think it was 1988, if I remember correctly, which was supposedly the year that the one girl, um, 
Oh, you know, the one that they credited with divine nonchalance, I think is what it was called. It disappeared or something like that. It's interesting because 88 was the year um, that Ong's had, you know, that they had first officially launched it. And I mean, I don't know if you know a lot about the the background of Ong's hat, but I mean, most of the people involved in it were also based out of the Bay Area, um, in this case, specifically Santa Cruz. It kind of seems like it grew out of this a group that they called Fog, uh, the Formless Ocean Group, uh, which uh, Joseph Matheny, the um, the main creator of Hong's Hat, was a part of, along with a lot of other interesting people, Robert Anton Wilson, Terrence McKenna, you know, that whole kind of crowd. I think Nick Herbert was a part of it, too. So it's kind of interesting that Hull also has that connection to San Francisco, and there was sort of that, you know, reference to the 1988 date. I kind of have wondered if that was maybe a sly nod to uh, the possibility that he was a part of that, you know, that kind of broader milieu that has uh, been doing a lot of this stuff with the arts, you know, for many years now. I mean, it, you know, really it is quite incestuous after having uh, studied it for, you know, quite a few, well, not quite a few, but a couple of years now. So, uh, you know, I do kind of wonder if there was possibly a, um, uh, a broader agenda at play you know, in those circles, because um, these guys were very sophisticated when it came to things like memetics. Um, there was really an excellent book written called um, Media Viruses, I think, by uh, Douglas Ruskoff, if I remember correctly. He was one of the big, you know, cyber culture chroniclers, along with Eric Davis. He was, I think, also briefly in the, the Temple of Psychic Youth or whatever Genesis Pete Orridge was calling his later projects. But regardless, he was a part of that whole crowd. He knew these people intimately, and uh, the media virus is really a very sophisticated look at their whole approach to memes and how this stuff, you know, could be seeded on, you know, back in this era, the 80s and zines and so forth, and then how how it was gradually taken into broader culture so that you could build something up, you know, into an actual movement. Uh, and this was the whole, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, atmosphere that was producing, you know, this climate that eventually became, you know, that led to these orgs like Ong's had and so forth. And there were, you know, there really were a lot of variations on even the whole ARG concept, I mean, coming out of that whole area. I mean, you could look at another group, um, uh, what was it the cypherpunks you know i mean that was sort of another one that had been influenced by all this this discordian kind of stuff and uh i think it was nick may or something like that it come timothy may that had come up with the whole notion of like the thought experiment um where you know you would essentially uh, uh try to set up a notion online of where you would have a uh, server that you could uh provide services to online without having to go through uh, official channels. You could use, you know, digital currencies, theoretically, things like that. And it was kind of like what, you know, led to the rise of Bitcoin. But I mean, it started as essentially something that was sent out in these mailing lists, uh, almost as a kind of game to see if you could inspire people to start working on this kind of stuff. And of course, the cyberpunk movement has been cited as a possible origin point for cryptocurrencies. It also sort of laid the model for what eventually became pirate bay this like whole notion that you could have like this online oasis where you could deal in contraband outside of federal authorities and there was also another novel concept that was promoted i don't think by may but by one of uh the people that came afterwards uh which i gotta be a little careful about talking about this but they charmingly referred to it as uh assassination politics uh, basically, if you didn't like somebody, uh, you could just go to this theoretical website, uh, you know, politicians specifically, and you could put a contract out for them. Somebody could uh, go and take out the contract anonymously online, and that was how we could vote. It's uh, an interesting uh, do you Do you have the URL for that site? Pardon me? Do you have the URL for that site, or is it on the dark web? Uh, the, you're talking about the original thought experiment. I will see if I can find it. In one, I mean, it's been written about in a couple of books. Um, uh, I'll send them some of the names to you here when we get off, uh, if they don't occur to me. But um, what was it? Crypto was one, I think. Um, by, or Cypher. Shoot, I can't remember now off the top of my head. But yeah, there's a couple of books on the whole cypherpunks where they get into some of these thought experiments. But they would have been done in, yeah, the early... Um, you know, Usenet groups, that there's kind of like mailing lists and stuff like that. I mean, this was sort of at the onset of the whole encryption movement as well. 
So, uh, no, what I was thinking of was the, the hit side, because, you know, it sounds to me like that's more likely to be like an FBI sting than a Yeah, well, side. and that's where it gets interesting. I mean, another, you know, sort of kind of proto-arg that came out of this milieu was um, um, the Chinese bl or Hong Kong Blondes, uh, which was started by this hacker collective called the Dead Cow. And basically, they were saying that there was this network of uh, hackers that were trying to subvert China's, you know, great firewall and all this other stuff. And increasingly, in hindsight, it seems like what they were trying to do was astroturf a movement. I mean, the cult of the dead cow had multiple people who were collaborating with the uh, U.S. intelligence services. And it got to the point where they actually had gotten one of these big hacker collectives rallied up to the, you know, where they were ready to actually launch a full-blown attack on um uh, China's server, and it had to be diffused by the cult of the dead cow. And I think the Chaos Computer Club in uh, Germany, if I remember correctly, because there was actually concern, you know, it could, uh, you know, if it kept going, I mean, it could have actually triggered, you know, a full blown uh, maybe cyber war between the US and China, like in the late 90s. But I mean, yeah, it does seem like from early on, they were almost doing this kind of stuff using, you know, zines, things like Wired, Mondo 2000 to kind of, uh, you know, almost add to this kind of astroturfing, at least as far back as the 90s. Yeah, that's really interesting. Do you think there is a cyber war going on at the moment? And if so, how intense is it? Uh, I mean, you know, it does seem like that, um, at least in some cases. I mean, it is interesting, too, with a lot of the stuff that seems to be going on with um, the infrastructures and whatnot. I mean, you had that kind of bizarre incident on uh, Christmas Day in the U.S., I, you know, if you recall, where uh, what the guy blew himself, it wasn't this year, it was last year, I think, where the guy blew himself up in Nashville or something like that, and it took down just ton of uh, the phone servers and that kind of thing and then of course i mean the whole you know the davos crowd the world economic forum i mean they've been kind of uh you know hinting at the possibility that there was going to be some kind of major cyber attack at some point in the near future um i mean certainly if you're correct and i mean they're maybe looking for a covert way to hasten the flippening if you will i mean it would i suppose be a compelling way to uh to get the nuclear you know uh infrastructure off off the grid yeah that would be a very nice thing if they'd do that um yeah i think uh they try to keep it off grid by using archaic software so i think they use Oh, that's like yeah. MBS it's like what a lot of seventies and eighties computers or something like that. Yes, I think hardware and software. I think they use COBOL and you know these old languages. And, um, I think Grace Hopper in, invented it in the Navy, and I think they still use it at least uh, on the ships and stuff. Occasionally, you see people advertising for for jobs, um, and then you know obviously front companies and that they do. FOIA um, protection by using outside contractors, obviously. But uh, yeah, that's um, that's I think what's what's going on. So if you you know you'd have to be really tuned in quite well to actually see the recruiting going on because I think it's done by places like um, uh, the Escape the Room. Have you ever heard of those Escape the Room things? I think there's one in um, in Houston. And you go through this observed sort of game, uh, and they're just testing you to see if you uh, are good good at these kind of sleuthing games. Um, and I went through one. It was uh, you know the fake moon landing one. <laughs> and um, yeah, I think what happens afterwards, they they sidle up to people and they they give them all a little you know card or note or something, and says. Uh, you did exceptionally well on this. Would you like to um, you know, come to this hackathon or something like that? And so then they'll uh, they'll pick people out that they they observe. Uh, you can you can see in the back room, there's uh, obviously a woman there sitting uh, assessing everybody uh, rather more intently than you'd expect for a game. And uh, yeah, then uh, I think then you know uh, all these people are put together at these conferences and it's it goes from there what's interesting there's the what is it the big hacker conference defcon um 
gosh, I think the guy who's uh, founded it now is like a member of like the Atlantic Council or something like that, the Council on Foreign Relations. I mean, it's in some of these cases, I mean, it's really rather avert that there is this sort of overworld presence. You've got guys like what's his name, Richard Time, I think their team, something like that, uh, who's pretty open about his connections to the NSA and this other kind of stuff. But um, I mean, I'm sure at this point there's probably chicker places to go to than DEF CON. Um, for the more elite hackers, but I mean, yeah, I suspect that what you're saying is absolutely right. Um, you know, there's always been a bit, uh, you know, obviously hackers aren't really a kind of profession that you want directly on the payroll for the intelligence services, and generally you want to keep them at arm's length because, frankly, a lot of them are rather unstable. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, I mean, you got to kind of find, uh, you know, subtle ways to sort of manipulate them a little bit. Uh, but that definitely seems like what they've been trying to do with the, you know, kind of open source intelligence approach that's become so popular in recent years. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we have a whole lot of questions. And let me um, go down the list because people have asked a number of things. Um, I think there's, um, I think we should ask guest ones. I have a question which I think you kind of answered and that's about Jeff Hull and Spencer McCall. Um, I think the, the next one was probably, I think Gary uh, says, uh, maybe an introductory question. How did Stephen first enter the high weirdness rabbit hole? <laughs> yes. How, how did that happen? Well, that is uh, certainly an interesting story um, in terms of like the... I mean, I guess when you get into like my more mainline, like parapolitical research, I probably got that more from my dad, who, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, was always kind of a bit of a conspiracy theorist. You know, I can remember um, listening to Bill Cooper with him, I think, when I was like six or seven years old, when we were in the midst of one of those, you know, kind of cross country trips uh, in the car. And, you know, you just are like listening, looking for something interesting to listen to on the radio station uh, as you're traveling through uh, the great American West and so forth. Uh, but in terms of like actual high weirdness stuff that came uh, later uh, when I was uh, had first started college, I think it was 19 at the time. And I was um, at the University of Colorado in Colorado Springs, uh, which is a rather dour place. Of course, Colorado Springs is home of a bunch of military bases. No rad is nearby. And it's also the, the headquarters for focus on the family. Uh, at the time, which is a big Christian fundamentalist sect, uh, for those of you not aware, it, uh, the DeVos family is involved with it. Eric Prince's family was involved with it for a lot of years. It attracts that, that kind of crowd. Um, at the time when I was in Colorado Springs, around 2004, it was the kind of place where people said prayers over their Big Macs at McDonald's. I'm not even kidding. Um, it was just really, <laughs> it was interesting to just observe some of this stuff, honestly. So anyway, um, I somehow managed to get uh, some mushrooms there. Uh, at the time, I hadn't actually tripped before. Um, this was like kind of coming after the, I think it was the Picard LSD bust um, in like 2000 or something like that. And after that it happened there was just really no lsd around in the united states uh for several years afterwards and it was always hard for me trying to find mushrooms or anything like that so i had kind of missed out doing psychedelics when i was like in high school and that kind of thing so i was excited to sort of try it for the first time so i went through the whole process i'm living at the dorms uh you know did the mushrooms it was a pretty normal experience i guess as far as uh, that kind of thing goes and then um seemed like the shrooms were like wearing off this was probably like around 11 at night or something and uh one of the few cool things about the dorms uh, is that they did this sort of like midnight meal thing at the cafeteria you could go in and they would make you eggs and pancakes and that kind of stuff and at this point in time i was getting a little hungry so i was like oh, maybe i'll go get some eggs or something like that so go into the cafeteria thing it was a normal cafeteria it's very white uh you know with that kind of decor but as soon as I walk in there, the whole thing is like engulfed in fog and so forth. And I can see the students walking around there and there are these uh, beings walking amongst them. And they were actually gray aliens, like at least seven or eight feet tall, 
all walking amidst the students, observing everyone, taking notes and so forth. And that's actually the only time, and I've tripped quite a few times since then. Um, and that's the only time I've ever had those sort of full on visuals like that, where I actually saw something there. And um, it was just very incredible to me because I hadn't at all, you know, I didn't have much of an interest in, you know, this kind of subject matter. I mean, I've been like a fan of the X-Files and that kind of stuff growing up. But I mean, I wasn't certainly fixated on UFOs or anything like that. So it was rather remarkable to just sort of suddenly walk in and see giant gray aliens just sort of standing there amongst the students with a, I guess, a proverbial fog machine or something like that um, within the cafeteria that provided suitable ambience for the whole experience so anyway i stood there just kind of gawking at that for a couple of minutes and then walked out and i think from that point on the shrooms basically wore off and uh i never really forgot the experience though and uh that had led me to start looking at you know basically had other people reported uh instances of ufos uh with psychedelics or you know aliens and that kind of thing and that you know led me to the whole notion of the you know terence mckenna's mechanical elves and so forth and uh, that was really what had been my sort of inroads to sort of high weirdness from there i kind of started getting interested in like remote viewing because i know people have also reported seeing aliens and those kinds of encounters and it sort of became a, a bit of a fixation for myself finding accounts of that where people believed that they had uh, experienced some kind of non-human intelligence or consciousness in an altered state of conscience, if you will. Yeah, that's interesting. You mentioned Terence McKenna, and I was wondering if there was any connection with Alan Watts, because, you know, the two of them seem to have been had quite a close connection. Do you know of any, anything that Alan Watts might have done in kind of discordianism or something like that that could have led to, um, you know, the machine elves kind of thing. Not really. I confess I'm not super familiar with Alan Watts. He never seemed to be very uh, keen on the whole thing. Um, you know, the, the impression I got was that there was quite a bit of uh, tension in point of view between the Leary camp and, and Watts. Um, it, the bots was only willing as far as to go. I think his famous little dictum was, uh, you didn't, I'd like to try it, you know, but when you, it's like a telephone call. When you've got the message, you hang up the phone, you don't stay on the line. Um, and that seemed to be as far as he wanted to go. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. I, the other thing I, I often wondered was, I don't think Watts and McKenna ever met because McKenna would have been quite young. I think at the time when, when Watts died. So I don't think there's a direct connection between them. Um, who, who was on the but, houseboat um, summit? McKenna? No, he wasn't there, no. Oh, who, who, oh I thought McKenna was there. Who, who was oh, there? no, no, McKenna's substantially younger than them. I can't remember the dates now, but I did look at their dates once because yeah, the thought McKenna was only like, what, 48 when he died, if I remember. Yeah, correctly. I think McKenna was would have been like a teenager when Watts died, uh, or, or at least not very much older than that. And I think that I couldn't see any reference to them ever having met. Um, uh, you know, I mean, that my explorations were all that comprehensive, but nor was there any mention of, the, of uh, McKenna referring to Watts either that, that uh, I ever came across. It'd be interesting if there was, um, because it seemed kind of like one of those meetings that would have been absolutely amazing, you know, if it had ever taken place, you would really want to know about it if there was any record, you know. Um, but... Uh, yeah, I don't know. Just, just, uh, just from what I've read of Watts, he wasn't really all that into the uh, psychedelic thing. It's uh, certainly not to the degree McKenna was at any rate. Have we lost Hugh? Hugh, do you think he has a bit of trouble with his connection sometimes? Do you want to look at the following questions, Gary? Maybe, um, maybe you because or can we... you? I can't see them. Um, I'm only on my phone, so if you might be able to see them I, more I have easily. A than I, can. I, if I yeah. have a visual, wait a second. Mm. 
Um, I was actually, I think there's a, a um, what Recluse was just saying a minute ago about uh, the, uh, the, the relationship between the UFOs and psychedelics could be something that he wants to explore, I think. With, but but Stephen, are you are you saying that your 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 initial experience with uh, psychedelics is what opened you to this interest or this um, uh, this, this rabbit hole? Basically, is that yeah? The, it's uh, it was the first time where I was really sort of confronted, I think, with um, uh, the possibility that reality, as we know, or you know, as we're taught it, I guess I should say, in school, isn't you know what it actually is, basically. So, yeah, it was the first time that it really sort of forced me to uh, look at the world in a dramatically different way, and it kind of opened up the the possibility to, I guess, more kind of supernatural explanations to things up to. Uh, you know, I mean, I like most Americans, I had been brought up in a nominally Christian household, though certainly my folks were not especially religious. You know, I mean, I can only recall attending church a handful of times in my life. Um, mm. I think I might even have been an atheist at this point in my life. If I, I can't remember if this was a by the time my flirtation with atheism had ended or not. But um, regardless, I was not an especially religious person. You know, I had uh, never really had a lot of interest in some of this kind of woo-woo stuff. Uh, but yeah, it was very different after all of that. And uh, it always had sort of uh, led me to, you know, postulate on like what could be causing some of this kind of phenomena. All right. Did you, um, did you... Uh... I mean, were you kind of drawn between whether what you were seeing was a projection or a perception? You know, was it just coming out of you or was it, or were you, you know, more inclined to think it had independent existence? Yeah, well, that, you know, sort of, I guess, cuts the heart of like one of, um, you know, Hugh's questions, I think, basically, mm. like, if I would, uh, agree with his conclusions i mean in a lot of ways i do agree because i do think that we create our own reality in a lot of levels but on the flip side mm. of the coin i do consider myself open to the possibility that there are non-human intelligences out there that we can interact with but then it also kind of raises another possibility which is uh, did the non-human intelligences predate our consciousness or did our consciousness create them in the first place? Uh, you know, I mean, almost kind of, um, you know, I'm sure a lot of you guys are probably familiar with uh, American Gods by Neil Gaiman, um, almost potentially, you know, that kind of a scenario or um, something that, you know, I guess some of the more recent groups like the Cybernetic Cultural Resource um was it cybernetic culture research unit i can't remember now the ccru but um you know they've sort of toyed with that whole concept of hyperstition basically where you could use fiction and uh, could turn it into a reality by manifesting its belief through social media and that kind of thing and it mm. got to the point yeah. where you know people um you know think that they've created characters and so forth that they're now able to like interact with consciously so i mean it does get into a lot of um you know, <laughs> very, yeah, it's not a, yeah. can I can I just ask a question there before? I think he was trying to reconnect. I think he's disappeared, so he's going to try to probably. But I, I come from a, I live in a country in Ireland, and um, we're a bit like in Iceland, where we live with the we live with the what you call the little people and the all sorts of uh, non-rational beings around us, and they're actually even up into into political circles and the justice system and. People take uh, notice of that, and also it appears to be behind certain decisions in construction and things like that, road planning, uh, everything. So, do you? What do you have to say about this? Because if this is, I mean, in these two countries, I know, well, Iceland and Ireland, this is part of life, in everyday life. You take that into consideration. Um, do you have any some, anything to say about this? I'm not sure if I'm entirely understanding what you're asking, like in terms of uh, what like I'm you're... saying, it's what you call reality, what 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 you are calling, well, what most people call reality here is um, as a complete different expanded definition, including entities and and beings that are not usually rational. Oh, okay. I'm not saying that I'm in the woo totally. I'm just observing 
the place where I live, and I've observed, for example, that the authorities have changed the place of a motorway in order to protect a ferry fort. The little people, we call them here in Ireland. In Iceland, there's other names for for the, the, the um, creatures. That I'm not talking about alien and extraterrestrial beings. I'm talking about terrestrial. Yeah, kind of like your nature spirits. Yeah, I think I see what yeah. you're saying. Well, yeah, and I mean, it is interesting because, I mean, I would say that that would be more of... Um, you know, I mean, a pre-modernist worldview where, I mean, typically most people did preserve, or I should say, that's, I mean, actually, that's rather condescending. I should say it's more of a magical worldview that was prevalent among much of humanity until really the last, you know, few hundred years with the, you know, the rise of the Industrial Revolution and the so-called Age of Enlightenment and that kind of thing, which essentially led to the rise of scientific materialism being the dominant paradigm through which much of the world, you know, views itself through. And yeah, I mean, I, I do think that that's important uh, on a lot of levels. Uh, and I mean, I do think that you know, right now that there is a consorted effort by certain groups probably for different reasons uh to revive you know that whole sort of magical worldview uh because it is something i think in a lot of ways that um you know there's power that comes from it and i mean it's been lost i think in a sense as we've gone into this sort of very secular hyper secular materialistic worldview have you had any experience uh, with that type you or gary or anybody here have you had any experiences of that type other than under psychedelics well yes i have also had experiences when i was not on psychedelics um another one uh was actually when i was in uh casadega florida uh, i'm not sure if you guys are familiar with casadega it's an interesting place it was um founded by the spiritualist church around the turn of the 19th and 20th century uh, supposedly they had followed a couple of spirit guides uh, down to florida to find the location um the spiritualist church was mostly based out of like new york state i should kind of add so this was you know at the time a bit of a trek down there to set up this community and uh it was definitely especially in that era i mean it was totally in the middle of nowhere i mean it would have been you know roughly between daytona beach florida and uh Delin, florida um so anyway um it's a very strange place i mean to this day it's still basically run by the spiritualist church uh, it's almost nothing but like fortune tellers and stuff like that it's a lot of like new agey kind of stuff uh but the park uh lake colby park is really interesting it's uh quite uh, large uh it's not legal to camp there though i have snuck on there on occasion and have uh, spent the night and uh, I did definitely have some very interesting experiences there. Um, one of them, uh, we were actually able to film like a little bit of it, but uh, there was at one point the original hotel had been uh, in the area that's now Lake Colby Park, uh, but it had burned down in the 1920s. Nobody really seems to know quite why. Uh, but anyway, there's a lot of weird ruins around there. There's also, um, you know, kind of a grove of like bamboo and stuff around like what would have been the front of the hotel. So we had gone into that particular area and uh, the entire time we were walking through the forest, it just, it seemed like something was following us through the trees, you know, like you could see them visibly shaking like quite violently. And this was a windless night. Um, it's Florida, quite a few miles inland from the beach. So I mean, uh, in the, especially this time of the year of the summer i mean the air is uh, pretty stuffy you know there's not a lot of movement so anyway we get down um into the groves and i mean suddenly there was just this force that was like coming through the trees almost like a you know somebody fired a cannon or something through them I and mean, we can see them like moving and they're coming directly at us and everybody else ran away and i stood my ground and i could feel the force come up on you know like right in front of me and then pull up like right in front of my face and go zooming up into the air uh, so yeah, I've had that. Um, I have seen uh, UFOs before as well, um, or at least. Uh, just uh, uh, you just uh, reminded uh, one of the questions I think we were going to ask was about the the difficulty of capturing, um, you know, images, UFO images, and you know, because you just mentioned there that you you managed to film a little bit 
during that experience. Yeah, we actually got a bit of an orb on camera. Yeah. Okay. Right. What's your? Um, I, I guess it's basically what the question was about. Was uh, uh, what's your feeling about the remarkable lack of of images and high, especially high quality ones, or or the fact that people have had immense difficulty. Um, getting anything at all, even when they've been trying very hard to do that. Uh, have you had any thoughts on what, why that difficulty arises? Well, see, that's where, you know, I have to park company with Lord Hugh a little bit, or at least based on, you know, how I interpreted uh, the video that he sent me. Because I do think the issues that we've had with capturing some of this, you know, could indicate that there is a kind of independent agency behind some of this phenomena. Because, I mean, it just seems like otherwise, you know, I mean, is every human being just sort of then otherwise innately programmed on a subconscious level to manifest this phenomenon, but then make it in a way so that they can never possibly document it. So it can, you know, subtly drive them insane over, you know, the course of their life or something. It just, it doesn't seem to yeah. make a lot of sense, which is where, I mean, I tend to think that there is some kind of independent agency, at least behind some of it. I mean, of course, when you get into things like UFOs, I mean, there is the possibility, uh, you know, at least in a fair amount of cases, that they are just simply classified government aircrafts, that kind of thing. There probably are more mm. like explanations for some of this stuff. But I mean, I do believe that there is genuine uh, paranormal phenomenon. Some of it is totally, you know, I mean, a psychic manifestation. But I mean, I do think that at least some of it presents enough independent agency to where, uh, you know, you have to kind of wonder if there's something else guiding it. But then conversely, yeah. you, um, you know, ESP is also notoriously difficult uh, to uh you know study under laboratory conditions as well so i mean it kind of seems like even in the cases of things that are you know supposedly coming internally i mean it's a little difficult to get hard evidence of it on camera or something well this is the thing um see i, I think uh part of hugh's take on it is that um uh it, there's a kind of uh inhibiting he calls it the cop in your head you know, where uh, I guess when a thing um, kind of like, a, I guess, a kind of psychic self-censorship in a way that, that you kind of go uh, self-sabotage, um, that, you know, you're seeing something or you think you're seeing something and then you try to record it and then completely confound yourself in the process of recording it because there's possibly a conflict between your... Um, even if you want to go so far as to say that you're creating what you're seeing yourself, there's probably still a part of you that is trying to be all rational and saying that this can't possibly be true and, and setting about um, making that appear to be so by, by uh, you know, causing you to not operate the camera properly or something like that. Um, so there's that, uh, there's that side of it. Um, as well as, you know, what you're saying, that there might be independent agency that creating or preventing. Um, I think, I'm inclined to think that what you would probably end up saying is that actually both of them are the same thing. Um, it's just being described or looked at from a different perspective. Well, certainly I could see that. And I mean, it does kind of go back to the, uh, you know, the point I had made earlier. I mean, if there are, uh, you know, non-human intelligences out there, uh, the gods, quote unquote, um, if I do say yeah. God at some point in this podcast, just assume I mean, yeah, yeah. around it. But um, yeah, I mean, it does kind of beg the question. I mean, were they truly non-human intelligences that emerged on their own accord or were they something that we created? Um, you know, that is a major question, I think, ultimately is just is belief ultimately everything behind a lot of this stuff or uh, is there something else needed in addition to belief i mean we all know that belief is hugely important and possibly even more important actually is action that's the other thing that nobody really talks about but action is also very important but i mean is there some you, other independent agency that's necessary do, do you want to just expand on that point a bit i'm not sure what you mean by that oh well, actually well yeah yeah i mean it's just like again you know well i mean it's you know, it kind of gets to the point of, like, why an ARG is so effective in the first place. I mean, 
Okay, so it's one thing to get people to believe in something, and that's all well and good. But I mean, if this belief mm. consists of nothing of sitting, but you know, sitting around in front of a computer screen or something like that, it's not really going to accomplish much of anything. Mm. To really, you know, get to where you're doing something constructive, you have to go out into the world and do something to bring about what it is that you believe in. This is why I think action is like such mm. a crucial component to uh, people's mm. lives. I mean, this is sort of why, you know, Damn. conversely, I think a lot of this new age mumbo jumbo, like the secret is just such absurdity, you know, I mean, it's all well and good to sit around and think like, well, I want to be a writer. I want to be a writer. But I mean, if I don't actually go out and, you know, try to write stuff or try to uh, get things published, uh, I'm not going to accomplish much by just sitting around and believing that that's what I want to do. Mm. Uh, you know, again, obviously having beliefs does help up to a certain point, but I mean, I think that to take things in a lot of cases in your own life to the next level, you know, you actually have to go out and, you know, take steps to constructively manifest these kind of things. If you're not doing that, uh, you know, there's only so far you can go with it. And I think that's, you know, the case of anything really. Um, you know, and especially in the case of ARGs, this is why I think they've proven to be so effective at creating cults in the 21st century, because, I mean, you're asking the people to be more than just passive participants in them. You're asking them to go out and actually do something. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, it was one of the things that uh, he was trying to work with was creating uh, an ARG um, and also just... Um, Using the group that we we that we formed here um, as a kind of a cult experiment too, uh, uh, which is curious because um, you know the question arose is arising as to whether whether you can form a cult of a group of people who know that they're going into a cult, um, you know, who are not. Um, or at least who think they've got their wise eyes wide open. <laughs> so, um, that's uh, that's also part of what we're sort of involved with here, monitoring that over a period of time to see uh, if we become good little cult members and, and are obeying the leader or, or um, that's a, partly a tongue-in-cheek thing that's going on here. And partly you got like vitamin uh, chart of coercion or something there that you go over like weekly? We've got some, um, yeah, we've got a... Um, a, uh, what's it called, Sophie? The list of desiderata extinctionati rules. And uh, yeah. Hugh has produced his manifesto recently. I don't know if he sent you a copy of it. Oh, that. yes, yes. Uh, no, I read the manifesto yeah. late, uh, mm. last night. Yes, no, it was quite interesting. Well, actually, um, to, to, quest to question the, the leader of our little cult, <laughs> um, I was wondering if you have more to say about um, the video. Uh, that Hugh published and sent to you, um, and do you, how do you diverge on his views on UFOs and other on other extraterrestrial phenomena? Because um, well, like I said, that would be my again. main, you know, sort of point is I question more, you know, if there is an agency, I think, outside of human consciousness at work. Uh, than I think Hugh does. I mean, again, I don't want to speak for him, um, but, you know, that was at least the sense that I got. Uh, but, I mean, otherwise, I think in a lot of it, you know, he's very much spot on. I'm, you know, very skeptical of the um, the extraterrestrial hypothesis. I've always uh, thought that it was very questionable. I mean, I kind of think that it was essentially put out there, you know, possibly as a bridgeway. Uh, you know, as I was kind of alluding to earlier to sort of get back to this, you know, kind of magical worldview from this, you know, materialistic scientific uh, paradigm that's really dominated a lot of Western, uh, and by default, a lot of the world's thinking for the last uh, couple of hundred years. Um, you know, it's something where, you know, you can get any number of scientific authorities to come out and postulate on how, from a statistical point of view, it stands to reason that there should be extraterrestrial life or something to that effect. Uh, which opens up the possibility of something miraculous, I guess, effectively in people's lives to which, you know, is a, maybe a, uh, a suitable avenue from which you could drive them into a worldview that is uh, less constrained by physical science, let us just say. And I kind of think that that was really, in a lot of cases, the long-term agenda for, you know, promoting the extraterrestrial hypothesis to the extent um, that we have, really. Because, I mean, it's just... You know, the more when we look at just how we've 
you know, from a scientific standpoint as well as I suppose a metaphysical one, just the common notion of, I mean, extraterrestrial visitations, you know, doesn't make any sense. I mean, as we've uh, branched out into the solar system, it looks like, I mean, a lot of the exploration we're going to be doing on the one hand is via drones and technology and so forth. And I think in a lot of cases, it stands to reason that an advanced species would do that as well. But I mean, also more to the point, if we're correct and, you know, psychic ability, ESP is a big part of this and you can you know, communicate with, I mean, other intelligences than your own species, you know, again, is it really worth going to the process of trying to travel the great distances across the galaxy and so forth when, I mean, you could already, you know, astral project or something like that. I mean, this is like another yeah. thing with people in the new age movement. I just find it baffling that they're so they are so obsessed with the notion that the extraterrestrials have to be coming here even though it's like but couldn't they just manifest here i mean what would be the point of having the bloody spaceships then <laughs> like, you know and and, and wh wh why is it so confined to the united states because honestly in europe it's not a big subject and um i'm not feeling that in asia and africa um there's a lot of time spent on these things why 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 is it so so centered on the United States. Why is yeah. ufology so centered on the United yeah, States? Yeah, ufology, yeah. <clears throat> well, I think, you know, again, it's specifically, I mean, it, you know, it's ideal, I think, to really bring mythology back into the United States. Um, one of my kind of favorites, uh, people in terms of parapolitical research, but also magic and that type of thing is Gordon White of uh, Rune Soup. And he was asked uh, an interesting question about uh, Game of Thrones. Essentially, if Game of Thrones was America's Lord of the Rings in terms of the fantasy genre. And he said, no, it was not. Uh, America's true uh, Lord of the Rings is uh, the Star Wars uh, franchise, which I think is absolutely spot on. Even though most people would consider it science fiction, it's definitely a fantasy work. It's a mythology, basically full blown, but it plays into an American kind of fantasy that would be centered around, you know, this sort of convergence between mysticism and technology. I kind of think that's really the big reason why it's so big here in the United States, because it you know, basically fulfills an essential psychological component of the American character. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, I actually uh, just something that came to mind. I, I don't can't quite uh, formulate a question around it, but where you were talking about uh, the uh, you know why are we trying to do all this stuff physically instead of so, um, psychically, and uh, I was just drawn back to um, uh, Helena Belvatsky and Charles Leadbeater and um, Annie Besant, you know, and a lot of the uh, these sort of occult explorations they did. Um, and, you know, that seems to have been a pursuit that's fallen by the wayside. Um, you know, uh, just personally, I felt a, a uh, it was something that like a lot of the potential. Society? The uh, the Theosophical Society, yeah, yeah. Um, and because uh, they did some... Uh, remarkable things. One thing that stuck in my mind was uh, um, uh, constructing the uh, periodic table um, and finding new elements, and of which later proved to be reasonably correct what they had done, and yet it had been done um, entirely, uh, you know, non-physically, not in a conventional scientific um, way at all, and, and some of the uh, the results were verified years later. Um, you know, and I mean that kind of thing just sort of alerts you to the potential of um, of uh, doing a lot of a lot of the things that, that we're trying to do physically. Um, that might not actually be the, the the best approach to them at all. But that's very interesting what you're saying, Gary, because that that's a bit the question that. Uh... Was put on the on the on the topics in question on the on the Reddit uh, sub. It's what's mm. the intersection between woo magic and no scientific laws? Do you know uh, mm. what? What would you think of that, Stephen? Um. Well, I mean, it's interesting because it seems like you know some of the stuff. 
Like, I think Hugh was just absolutely spot on when he got into the stuff with like the psychotronics and what have you, because I mean, it does seem mm -hmm. like that we can develop technologies that can further enhance our psychic abilities. And again, you know, it's sort of interesting getting into like what Gary was saying with the Theosophical Society. I mean, a lot of people don't realize this, but I mean, most psychotronics, you know, basically came full blown out of the cult orders. Um, mm. Ironically, I'm actually about to um, do a podcast uh, once I finish up with this one with a gentleman where we're going to talk about the legacy of psychotronics and occult orders. But anyway, mm. um, yes, I think the first really widespread use of this was... Um, Again, by an American group, it was, what was it, the Ancient Mystical Order of the Rosy Cross, or AMROC, I believe, is yeah. Yeah. commonly referred to. But yes, they had started yeah. to develop a whole, you know, kind of slew of psychotronic devices uh, during the early 20th century. And it was later taken up by, you know, quite a few other occult groups. Uh, another, you know, fairly notorious one in that regard was the Brotherhood of Saturn, the Fraternus Saturnia or FS, uh, I think they had even developed a full-blown Tesla death ray kind of thing or something oh, like yeah. that. Mm, and, uh, yeah, yeah. But, um, and then, you know, you kind of see the intersection as well with, um, you know, the national security state. I mean, another uh, group that had explored psychotronics was the Temple of Set, uh, which was famously founded by the now late Colonel Michael Aquino, he of uh, From PsyOps to Mind War Infamy. Um, so that was kind of another interesting element of that. But yeah, and then there was, uh, I think, some groups tied to Kenneth Grant's followers as well. But there does seem to have been this long-standing legacy with these use of the psychotronic devices among the occult orders. So I think that this sort of knowledge of this kind of stuff was known, at least in these circles, for quite a considerable amount of time. Um, from what I gather, I mean, the Russians had quite a bit of interest in this from fairly early uh, in the Soviet era. I mean, this was, of course, around the, the time. Uh, even now, um, just, uh, you know, it's at a rather casual look around on the Internet uh, in Russia today, you notice that, uh, that, you know, alternative healing techniques and a, and a whole raft of things that are considered ex quite fringe in, in a lot of Western countries seem to be quite uh, accepted there just as, uh, you know, integrated into everyday life. Uh, um, it's, it's, it's interesting to see that kind of preservation of something that has, um, you know, got a different, uh, different publicity profile, in, in, especially in America. Well, I think a lot of it has to do with the legacy of cosmism uh, within Russia. I mean, certainly it was very influential among key elements of their scientific community. Um, so I can't remember any of the names. And even if I could, I would absolutely butcher it because I'm terrible with pronunciations. And God, I mean, it's Russian. I mean, come on. But anyway, um, yeah, I mean, the, one of their major figures behind like their rocket program, for instance, was a cosmist. So, I mean, there was you know, a lot of this influence on the scientific community. And I mean, cosmetism was basically the, the real precursor, if you will, to transhumanism. I mean, it was essentially this notion that man had a divine right as given by, or divine mandate as given by God to spread out into the universe and colonize space and bring life to this dead, you know, vast universe. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, you know, and in this process, yeah. they were also going to develop life extension technologies so that eventually we could achieve immortality and all of this other good stuff. Yeah. So yeah. it was very much a, uh, you know, a proto transhumanist ideology. And it was obviously adapted by a lot of other movements. The extropians, which was kind of the, you know, libertarian version of transhumanism, were also sort of influenced by this kind of stuff. But it was big in, you know, Russian. Uh, Russia's scientific community and even after the Soviet Union and uh, specifically Stalin. Stalin was the one who really tried to finally crack down on some of this kind of weird stuff. But I mean, even, you know, despite all of the purges and what have you, I mean, he wasn't able to rid uh, the scientific community of some of these more arcane notions. And uh, I mean, interestingly, the Soviet Union really kind of had its own sort of, uh, you know, age of Aquarius in the 60s as well in terms of uh, oh, okay. sort of open 
discussions about UFOs. They had uh, briefly allowed citizens to start reporting instances to the uh, the authorities. They had also started to talk more openly about the psychotronic work that they were doing. Of course, this was uh, really kind of the beginning of the heyday of a lot of that type of research in the USSR, though, I mean, it was, it was never really that extensive. But I mean, also, there was some of the ESP stuff that was being done. And, you know, again, it wasn't as extensive as it was depicted to the American public through, you know, psychic discoveries behind the Iron Curtain and that kind of thing. And there were definitely mm. periodic crackdowns uh, by the Soviet authorities on this kind of stuff. But there was, you know, quite a bit of openness uh, about it, more so at least after the 60s. And yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it's never really gone away. There's always been, I think, that much more mystical approach, I suppose, to science uh, within Russian culture, which I suppose is a great irony given um, the almost fanatical attempts that have been made to bring them into sort of the the materialistic paradigm. Um, yeah, I, I, I must admit, uh, I mean, I don't know nearly as much as you about these things, but uh, just uh, to get that sort of general impression to think, hey, you know, they're... they're uh, they're integrating something here. Um, but, you know, you can see, too, their kind of um, tension there, even if it wasn't being actively, attempts to actively suppress it, there's probably still a, a tendency to be drawn by the kind of scientific purity, of, you know, hyper-rationalism and all that kind of thing that's infecting everything. Um, so uh, um, I just wanted to interrupt for a minute. Um, because Hugh, I, I know, was very keen to develop some points with you. Um, just as a suggestion, might it be better to to uh, to cut this meeting a little bit short? Is there any chance that we can get you back again for another one? Um, that Hugh's going to be with us? Yeah, I, I tried oh, yeah, to message yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'd love to come back. Yeah, I've what tried to think? message Hugh on his phone, and he's not answering either. He must be phone. out. Yeah, well, it must be What's because he's on the, the phone. Uh, anything that could happen, you know. Um, well, it's the weather, I think, affects him yeah, there, yeah. that it comes in. Um, uh, look, Recluse, I, I'm, I think it might be um, uh, because I th he, he can really take this to a, a level beyond, <clears throat> with you, beyond uh, which I, I don't think Sophie and I are quite capable of, of, uh, of um, achieving. It might be just a better use of, of our time this and your time. This is definitely not just subject. This is, we're more learners on this mm. subject than uh, so yeah. we will hear more to learn than to question really. So yeah, maybe you're right. I think I agree with you, Gary. Whenever you, well, if it's okay are, with you. Are you, um, are you happy with that, Reclusi? Are you happy to come back and, and make another date with us? And, uh, or yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's, uh, that's fine with me. Yeah, all right. Well, we might just maybe just wind this one up. I mean, I could talk to you for hours. <laughs> I uh, only have listened to um, a couple of your farm podcasts and was kind of sucked in totally instantly, um, and uh, especially to do with the uh, the book, the first uh, part, the first um, section of your uh, trilogy, um, which is, uh, wow, there's it's an enormous amount of stuff in there that you could go into. Um, so, um, all right. Well, look, we'll, we'll leave it at that for, for now. Um, and uh, who contacted you, Recluse? Was that who got in contact with you or was somebody else from here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of my um, <clears throat> listeners, Joseph Dutro, I think, uh, was the mm. one who had brought you guys to my attention. Mm. And then I had asked you to come on the farm a couple of Actually, I think it was about a year ago now. I feel bad. I keep uh, meaning to bring him back on the farm. I've just been so busy. But yes, now that I've uh, yeah. uh, had a chance to read the manifesto, I was definitely going to bring him back on so he could uh, discuss that. Yeah, yeah. Um, All right. So okay. We're going to well, do this again. We're going to do this yeah, again. We'll, we'll do it again. Yes, yes. Yeah, I'm sure he was going to want to make a very another another meeting with you very soon. As soon as he's got his technical problems yeah. sorted. Thank you so much, um, Stephen, for coming on. Yeah, thanks for well, coming thank you on. For yes. me. I like the podcast to... too. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> okay, all of us in. Thanks. Well, have a good day, Alex. All right, then. Thanks for coming. Um, oh, you're, you're, you're...